we are on a journey. We are on a journey that began with our celebration of diversity, and it moved, of course, to our honoring of equity and the commitments that, that rightfully flow out of equity. And of course, we're moving to that place of inclusivity. And it's really moved from being a movement that was confined to a group of enthusiasts to now being a much broader movement that's captured the hearts and imaginations of so many. This is a wonderful opportunity for learning and important conversations. I encourage you to take what you learned here today and apply it in your own schools and workplaces. We are proud to be one of the top performing school boards in the province, and it is thanks to people like you who make that happen. Our school communities and our parents are very thankful. Our journey, our story as a school board, has been one that has moved over many years towards this place of equity and inclusion. To borrow from the words of our director's annual speech, we can, in turn, create an experience, a new, different kind of chapter in our story. One that includes both hope and optimism. A chapter in which access to success and well-being is real for every staff member and every student. We are the first school board in the province to adopt and incorporate an anti-oppression framework into our work toward inclusivity. What distinguishes it from other approaches? I will leave the answers to these important questions to our incredibly knowledgeable and eloquent speaker, Dr. Aparna Mishratarik, who will guide us through an understanding of the anti-oppression framework, or what's commonly referred to as AO. As a child, I was helpless to change the world that I was in. But as an adult, I'm an adult, I have a responsibility to change the world that, that, that students are in. And this is what drives me. It's orientation. It's not a set of lessons that you can apply. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of acting. It's acquiring a language that can help you think and act in uh, responsive ways with students. We make the road by walking. The more thinking the person is, the more fully he or she enters into reality so that knowing it better, he or she can transform it. This individual is not afraid to confront, to listen, to see the world unveiled. Part of this framework involves doing our own groundwork, beginning from where each of us stands. Furry found that taking responsibility for oppressive systems and conditions, and that's what we do in this framework, we take responsibility for conditions that we actually didn't make. They've been historically imposed upon us and imposed upon schools, imposed upon children's lives. But we take responsibility. And that begins with each of us and our own formative understandings of justice, fairness, and, and equity. We are gatekeepers, and we can open up a world and we can close the world for people. And assuming responsibility of the world means opening it up, this world, not our world. In a whole school approach to anti-oppression, the entire adult and child school community models equitable behavior and intervenes in systemic injustice on a daily basis, learns about the lived realities of each other and students, and works to provide curricular experiences that support children to be critically literate of social injustice and media representations. Through critical and digital literacy, adults can support students to generate healthy narratives of themselves with which to imagine themselves and their future. And that's what it's really about. Let's produce healthy, healthy narratives. Our country is rapidly changing. And this is a moment in which we can finally, I think, finally see equity, diversity, and inclusion as a resource. And Canada's always had that orientation. And teachers have always had that orientation. So we just have to really put it into practice. biological sex of an individual is really not as relevant as how they identify in their gender. The workshop at this conference was really important that we, we ensured that it uh, represented all facets of our LGBTQ student and family community. And the fact that we create schools and inclusive learning environments where each child feels welcomed, feels a sense of well-being, feels a sense of belonging, connectedness and inclusion to uh, the school community to which they belong. We don't understand our own positioning, our own understanding, our own thinking.
how is it possible for us to help other people or to work with other people? So the religious accommodation policy will be coming out pretty soon. With that, there's a company, PD, and webcast that's also going to... Talking about religious accommodation for our students and for our staff, we, we have to consider what will help our students to manage the curriculum that is in front of them and to also transform the curriculum. So one of the things we talk about is that it's not about creating a space for these people within an already structured environment, but transforming the space so that we consider different options that are available to them in terms of curriculum, in terms of their day-to-day -day activities, in terms of parent engagement, and an always evolving conversation with community. As a teacher, I think it's really important that we have our sensitivities heightened to some of the issues around equity in the classroom and in the school, among staff and among students. And uh, I, I appreciated the opportunity that we've been given to get a framework for this. Um, I hear the speaker this morning who was just really demonstrative of an open-minded attitude. Are we meeting our students' needs? Do we know who our students are? Because that is our responsibilities of educators, is knowing who they are so that we can meet their needs. We need to be able to talk about it. And even in 2013, it's still considered a courageous conversation. So we need to continue to move forward and question. I think it's so tremendous that we have the opportunity to come to something like this, um, to share our thoughts, but also to know that we're part of a journey. Um, that we can make a difference. There was a lot of food for thought today. Um, the ability to recognize and challenge privilege as being the first step in moving from equity to inclusivity was a critical point. Uh, also, the need for us to adopt an anti-racist orientation in the way we think, the way we speak, in order to be able to uh, recognize and challenge privilege to create dissonance and to interrupt the status quo. It really needs to be part of our personal and moral fiber as to who we are. We are really pleased to announce that this spring we will be launching York Region District School Board's first ever Every Student Counts survey. And it will be a survey that will be administrated to all students in the school board to determine exactly who they are so that we can better serve their needs. We're so excited to now be able to and take our equity journey that much further so that we can start talking about anti-oppression. The anti-oppression framework provides an opportunity for us to really look and understand uh, oppression, marginalization, and then expand that learning to the multiple social identities that have significant impact on our students in schools and our families. We are the only board that sets specific targets in our board improvement plan for equity and inclusion. And you set specific targets and measures in your department plans and in your school plans. And that's we should celebrate that. We, we must celebrate that we have a superintendent of equity. Others do not. So we have to celebrate. We have to celebrate the progress that we have made as an organization.